Um, so today I wanted to talk about like uh, alternatives to deploying containers in, in production uh, without using Kubernetes. Um, so yeah, my name is Clément Verna. I'm actually now an engineering manager at Red Hat and I'm working with the CoreOS team. Uh, so we are involved with uh, Fedora CoreOS and also Red Hat CoreOS and uh, the OpenShift uh, product. So why, why would we uh, look at um, alternative to, to Kubernetes when we want to deploy containers? Because I think currently we can, we can all agree that the main uh, like common solution to um, like the problem of running containers in production or contain, containers workload is to go for, for Kubernetes. Um, and really, I think Kubernetes and using containers in production as the goal has like many, many different goals. And I try like to sum them up on, on this slide. Um, I think mostly it's around like reducing the, the system administrator cost, infrastructure cost, and the, the time uh, that uh, the time of people that needs to be on the, the infrastructure and need to be caring for for your uh, for the servers and for the services and things like that. Um, a big factor also is to reduce the time needed to to make a project available. And we hear a lot about like MVPs and like time to market and, and things like that. So being able to deploy. A solution or a service or an application fast and have like quick feed feedback is very important. And um, with all this, also there's been like a, a big push uh, on like GitOps. So having a lot of the um, operation task or operation knowledge and um, stored in version control and stored in Git. So you, instead of having to uh, log into a server and run some commands, you would pretty much just change some files in Git and have, um, have like some automation or have like some type of CI CD to, to manage your, uh, your infrastructure for you. Um, you also want to be able to do clever updates. So with Kubernetes and uh, containers, you have like all those concepts of like, uh, green blue deployment or canary testing or, or things like that. So you, you want to be a bit more uh, smarter and be able to do some more uh, interesting thing with updates. And uh, a, a lot of uh, a lot of people are also looking for this um, flexibility between uh, running your own servers on your own infrastructure and also be able to to use like the public cloud or like. Um, over our cloud provider, and to to me, I think the maybe the biggest reason to go for Kubernetes is the scalability. And if you think that your service or your application will have a big need of scalability and need to be able to uh, to scale a lot of uh, a lot of services to uh, to response to like uh, user demands, uh, Kubernetes is probably a, a good solution. If you don't have that need, uh, that might be interesting to look at alternatives and not necessarily go to the to Kubernetes and to the added complexity. Um, so I, I try to put here in, on this slide like kind of like the two solution where having Kubernetes is like this big boat with like all those workflows and those containers and everything is is very well managed and uh, very um, very well organized, um, but sometimes you don't really need to have like such a big infrastructure and such a big investment. Uh, you might just be fine with a train, like and 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 just like running some smaller workloads and smaller containers. Um, an interesting fact fact it's. Um, if we look at the CNCF, the, the Cloud Native um, Foundation, um, for last year, 2020, uh, they're, they're running a survey every year. And you see that 20% of the respondents of that survey 
uh, have a fleet of 20 or uh, less machines. So, and you can see in the very low, in the one to five, it's actually uh, raising. So people that have like a very small infrastructure, so one or five, like one to five VMs uh, or bare metal servers uh, are starting to run containers and does it make sense to to look when we have like such a small infrastructure, such a small foot, uh, footprint? Is it really uh, something to to consider to to run Kubernetes? In some cases, yes, but I think it's uh, it's also uh, nice to to be able to have alternatives and to uh, to not necessarily default to uh, to Kubernetes. Um, I think the twenty one to fifty. Uh, servers is also maybe uh, a case where you can start to to think and to be uh, to be on, on the edge. Um, but yeah, definitely when you start to to go into the higher end and like definitely if you have like more than five thousand uh, VMs or servers or bare metal, yeah, you you probably want a, a something that helps you to manage all those all those machines and um, helps you to schedule your, your workload. Um, so one possible alternative is to go with uh, services that are provided for you. And in that aspect, the, like cloud providers or uh, infrastructure as a service providers uh, give you uh, some possibilities. So here I listed like maybe the three most famous, uh, the Azure Container Instance, AWS Fargate and uh, Google Cloud um, Cloud Run uh, service. Um, and really, I think this is probably great if you really don't need to care about infrastructure and operating system, and you just really, uh, you have like a project, you, want, you have your code, you want to build it, deploy it, and um, you know, like, you're really not interested into like how your service runs and uh, what is behind. Uh, this. Uh, probably a trade-off of that uh, is that uh, you are going to build your delivery pipeline and it's going to be strongly coupled to uh, your provider. So if you look for flexibility to be able to run like on on premise and in the cloud at the same time, or be able to scale through different cloud or change later, uh, it's going to be probably quite a lot of work to to move uh, out of that service. Uh, so again, if you start to think about uh, running containers in production, that's probably um, here something to consider about like advantages and, uh, and trade-offs uh, that are there. So um, I think the going for public cloud uh, or those types of services are probably a great thing if you want to uh, do some type of proof of concept or you know like really something really fast to you to your users to get those feedback uh, but maybe longer term i think it might be more interesting to to like have a solution that would be uh, provider agnostic and that you could uh, you could pr pretty much run on any any cloud or in your own infrastructure um, I think it's interesting to look a bit at like what would be your kind of DevOps or delivery pipeline workflow. Uh, so with this solution um, for the cloud's provider, uh, you pretty much have your code and your test, you run that, your traditional development environment. Uh, the build side is an interesting, uh, interesting phase. I think you can either have it part of your uh, like CI pipeline and do your container builds, you know, just like uh, uh, normal using uh, Docker files or builder or any type of uh, container uh, build mechanism. And uh, once you got your container artifact, you can uh, just uh, use uh, some of the, the platform dedicated services to deploy those uh, those containers and quite often also uh, the cloud providers also offers you like uh, dedicated monitor services where you can uh, monitor your application and uh, see how that works. 
Um, one thing to consider also is that uh, most of the time the service that you're developing is is not going to be uh, self-sufficient. You will often need other uh, services like databases or like uh, you know storage or things like that. So um, if you go the cloud way, uh, you will also consume those other services from the from the cloud provider and from the from the platform. Um, so what are the other altern alternatives? And today I will mostly focus about like uh, Linux and uh, see what's happening in the in the in the Linux ecosystem about like dedicated solution for for running containerized application. Um, in particular, I will focus on on what we do at Fedora and our Fedora Core OS uh, um, um, offering. Um, but pretty much, uh, when you think about it, uh, what you really want to to run containers is uh, you want your Linux kernel, obviously, to be able to uh, to create containers. Uh, you want a way to provision uh, your servers uh, so it can be automated, it can be uh, quick and, and fast. Uh, you want security, so you want your server to have like the latest updates. Uh, you can also make great use of SC Linux to harden the harden your security, and you want some type of uh, container manager or uh, co container engine. So uh, I listed a few like Podman, Docker, or uh, any other other uh, container manager, and that's pretty much all you need and all you should be uh, concerned to have in your like Linux distribution. Um, and there are like many offerings and they are like, uh, while the philosophy is pretty much the same, there are like many different ways of doing. So I listed like the, the main here <clears throat> and you can see that for example, uh, it's quite interesting, but the cloud providers also have their, their solutions. So for example, AWS, they, they, they have like bottle rocket, um, but they are also like more traditional Linux distribution. So like Fedora Core OS or OpenSUSE uh, Micro OS and um, over, over solution like this. Um, so if we, if we come back to like why, uh, why you want to run containers in production and why would you go for, for Kubernetes? Uh, if we look at like Pretty much each each criteria, and we try to to look at um, how uh, Linux distribution like Fedora Core OS uh, matches those criteria. Um, so about system administrator cost, infrastructure cost. Um, one of the big thing uh, that one of the big feature for Fedora Core OS is uh, about automatic updates, and you kind of want to have this philosophy of like you deploy it and you forget about it because the operating system will will manage itself and will update itself. Um, you want to reduce the time needed to make project available. So it's very easy to deploy and provision. You can adapt, you can start to think about having your operating system within your development uh, pipeline and um, We'll see later. I think it's quite an interesting concept to to start to think about. Um, so yeah, spinning up uh, Fedora Core OS VM, it takes less than a minute to provision it and uh, have your service running. Um, version control, so all the configuration to provision the, the operating system is uh, in configuration file, so as a YAML or translated to JSON, so easy to store and e easy to to adopt the GitOps uh, philosophy. Um, yeah, coming back to clever updates, uh, really for Fedora Core OS, the main uh, one of the main um, goal of the of the distribution is to have stable updates and updates that don't break, and um, and be able, being able to run on premises or in the cloud, and I think that's probably also one of the great um, 
value that you get from projects like those is that um, you uh, currently, uh, Fedora Chorus is available on 12 platforms. So I listed a few here, but like most of the main platforms are, are there. And it's very, it's very easy to run from like one platform to the other. And uh, since you have the common, uh, the common base and common trunk of, of Fedora Chorus. Uh, so going back into a bit more details about like some of those features. Um, so really, uh, as I was saying, the updates is really uh, something we care a lot uh, because if we want people to use automated updates, we want them to be uh, rock solid and not break anything. Uh, so um, the development of Fedora Chorus is using uh, extensively uh, CI pipelines and we're testing on different providers. So for example, we have a AWS. We're making sure that Fedora Core OS mm -hmm. is uh, working well on AWS. Yeah? 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, on AWS or uh, Google Cloud and over like more like on-premise cloud, uh, uh, like OpenStack or just like libvirt for like virtualization. Um, and we're making use of uh, of um, the RPM OS3 technology. Uh, I'll talk a bit uh, quickly about it uh, after. Uh, where in the case uh, in the case of uh, an update that would break your your workflow and break your application, it's very easy to come back to the previous state. So you you have this concept of rollback where. Okay, I got an update, it's not working. Let me just go back to the previous state that was working. And in the future, we will be working on automated that rollback. Uh, so user could specify some health check, making sure that your service is back up or like you have like a da database access or thing like this. And if that does not happen, you would come back to the previous state. Um, so talking about like the streams that are offered by Fedora Core OS, uh, we have like three streams, next testing and stable and pretty much, yeah, uh, you, you want to be able to have like uh, a few machines in your fleet that are on next and testings and they kind of, uh, uh, they kind of are your canary uh, VMs or canary uh, nodes. Uh, that you can use to to test what is coming to the stable stream. So uh, there is a um, Fedora Chorus is releasing every two weeks, and usually the testing stream is promoted after two weeks into stable. So during this two weeks period, there is there is time to get feedback, and if you see that uh, something stops working on your uh, machine that is running the testing stream, it's it's the perfect time to give the feedback to to the to the project, and uh, we'll be able to fix it and uh, not break the stable stream. So yeah, really, the stable stream is something we want to be uh, rock solid and uh, not break. Um, about provisioning, uh, and that's probably something that is a bit uh, uh, like different compared to uh, over Fedora, uh, uh, like uh, artifact over Fedora release, um, like the workstation or the server edition. Um, Fedora Core OS is using Ignition, um, and it's uh, allowing us to uh, to automatically provision. Uh, like one from like one VM to thousands of VM the same way. So it's uh, using a declarative way and um, everything is done like from a fresh, uh, like a fresh starting point. So uh, you will always have the same uh, provisioning using the same configuration. Um, and yeah, in more traditional way, you might be a bit more familiar with kickstarts for bare metal or cloud in it. And with Fedora Chorus, you just use the same uh, the same configuration file and the same mechanism for uh, for every platform. So be it bare metal or cloud in it, you just have the same the same mechanism. Um, so but. Uh, like how the versioning works and the security for, for Fedora Core OS. And so I talked quickly about the RPM OS3, but it's often 
like compared as like Git for your operating system, uh, pretty much the whole image of your operating system is um, is in a commit like uh, object, and you have a you have a version number and you have a hash. So it's very it's very easy to know which version of packages you have in the, in that uh, version and in that hash and uh, that's a great way to uh, to track uh, what you're running in production, but also that's a really amazing way to do testing uh, because you you know really bit by bit what is uh, what is in your operating system. Um, another uh, feature is that we it is a read-only file system, so um, it prevents accidental uh, corruption or like uh, some sort of uh, like attacks where you would be uh, where um, um, like uh, attack to go and try to modify uh, files on, on the systems and try to um, get some more privileges or things like that um, and obviously uh, we have a, a C Linux enforced by default so that also helps uh, a lot uh, security wise Okay, so if we look back at the workflow, we have something like a, like container uh, for like something like Fedora Core OS or a container OS. Um, I mean, you suddenly get a level of abstraction where, that you can uh, start to put into your delivery pipeline. Uh, so you have your code, your test, and now what you build uh maybe where where you start to have like some dependencies in in the way you're building your application because now i think you don't want to build only a container you want to build the container plus operating system solution and your service what you're starting to release is not is not a container anymore but it's this combination of container and uh, operating system so you can start to test your application running uh, against the specific version of your operating system and what you're testing is exactly what you're going to deploy um, so here really i think uh, this container plus plus provisioning configuration is is really the artifact that you want to to release at the end of uh, of your uh, delivery pipeline um, a good example that uh, we've worked recently is to uh, run a, a matrix server. So matrix is a, a communication uh, a protocol, uh, open open pro communication protocol, and they provide an implementation of that uh, protocol uh, called Synapse. And uh, the project uh, provides uh, everything as a containers, but you don't really have like a, a solution where you can almost like yeah, press, click, and deploy, and you have a, you have like uh, all the services needed to to deploy that service. Uh, so a good example here is using Fedora Core OS uh, and the Ignition Config, where you will define all the provisioning uh, of uh, all the services. You can have that solution where you have your uh, operating system image and the configuration of your services and that two artifact gives you a service that is ready to deploy anywhere. So either on your uh, infrastructure or on the cloud. Uh, if you want more uh, information, there, there is a link to a GitHub repository where you can try that and you can deploy your own, uh, own server. Um, and finally, we've, uh, we've like more traditional Linux distribution, you also uh, get uh, the benefit of having a community behind and being able to talk to people and like get involved also in the project and uh, try to uh, to propose changes or improvement to the project. Uh, so I think that's also a great aspect uh, when you look at uh, at solution to run your containers is to be able also to to be part of a bigger community and be involved with uh, with uh, people. Um, so a few links I will share after in the chat the link to the presentation. But yeah, if you want to get started or uh, more interested, there are a few links there. And tomorrow uh, there is also a workshop. Uh, uh, so getting started with Fedora Core OS. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, I encourage you to. 
to participate to the workshop. And that's it. I think <sighs> should have like a few minutes left for questions. Um, maybe a black like one question. Then we need a time to for to prepare for the next talk. Uh, but we have two actually in the Q and A section. So let me look at it. Are the processes uh, so are the processes that are solidifying as uh, best practice for GitHub Linux to Fedora Core OS? No, I don't think it's uh, it's unique for Fedora Core OS. I think uh, other other um, um, O other solution as well as like cloud provider solutions or other uh, Linux, um, uh, Linux, uh, tiny Linux or like container Linux uh, operating systems uh, are also following that way. So I think that's probably uh, something that uh, when you start to be in the con uh, like the the wanting to run container in uh, in production, I think this is something that uh, you see a lot like. Trying to adopt those uh, GitOps uh, practices. Uh, 